USAC Midgets, Orange Show Stadium in San Bernardino. The leading drivers, Tommy Kopp in car three. The famed one-armed driver, Alan Heath in 97. Number 27, Bob Tattersall. 11, Mike McGreevy. The five car, Billy Cantrell. 98, Carnelli Jones. 96, George Snyder. 99, Corky Rockowitz. The 82 car, Hal Minyard. 45, Bob Wenty. The cars are pushed off for the start. Here's the parade lap with Alan Heath in 97 setting the pace. The green flag is down and there we go. Heath in the 97 car moves into the lead. Down the back straightaway and pulling away. Moving into second place, the three car, Tommy Cobb. In the front straightaway, it's still Alan Heath in car number 97. Tommy Kopp in car three and the 96 car, George Snyder. Here's your first five positions. Your leader, 97, Alan Heath. Three, Tommy Kopp. 96, George Snyder. 21, Grimm. And 11, Mike McGreevy. Into turn one, down tight on the inside. Here comes Parnelli Jones picking off two cars and taking over third place. Here's the standings, 97, your leader, Alan Heath. Three, Tommy Kopp. 98, Parnelli Jones. 27, Bob Tattersall. 11, Mike McGreevy. Parnelli Jones in car number 98 has moved up to second place and is challenging the leader, Alan Heath, in car number 97. Front of the grandstand, the 98 car takes the lead. Here's your new leader in car number 98. 97, Alan Heath. 27, Bob Tattersall. 3, Tommy Kopp. 11, Mike McGreevy. Here are the last two laps. Car number 63, losing it in the main straightaway. Here comes Parnelli Jones in the 98 car to take the checkered flag in the midgets at San Bernardino, California. Your winner, car number 98, the Agagenian Special, Parnelli Jones. The Atlanta 250 for USAC championship cars. Here's your drivers, number 54, Bobby Unser. Car number 12, Mario Andretti. Car number one, A.J. Foyt. Car number 59, Jim Herdebees. Car number two, Johnny Rutherford. The six car, Bud Tinglestead. The 16 car, Billy Foster. Car number 19, Chuck Rodee. Car number 25, Roger McCluskey. The 76 car, Gordon Johncock. The crews make careful last minute adjustments. The cars are being checked and rechecked. Energizer brought out to the starting line to start these machines. Over a million dollars of racing machinery here on this one and a half mile high bank that Atlanta track today. Anxiously, the drivers circle the high bank on parade. Out of turn four, down the front straightaway. There's the green flag and we're underway. In car number one, A.J. Point jumps into the lead. Billy Foster in car number 16 on the outside, running second. Out of turn number two, it's the number one car. It's Point, followed by Foster in car number 16. Down the back straightaway in car number one, he's building up a tremendous lead, setting a blistering pace. He's out in front where he likes to race. Around turn four, it's Point and Foster. Point in car number one. He's built up a five-car length lead over the 16 car. Young Billy Foster of Victoria, British Columbia. Bobby Unser has moved out of the pack and into third place. Boyd and Foster running well out in front. All of the big car drivers are settling into their grooves for the 250-mile long race here today.
Here are the standings. Point in number one. Second, the 16 car, Billy Foster. Third, car 54, Bobby Unser. Fourth spot, Gordon Johncock, car number 76. Your fifth place driver, car number 12, Mario Andretti. Down the front straightaway, it's developing into a two-car battle between Foyt in car number one and Foster in the 16 car. Car builder, A.J. Watson, checks his box on Johnny Rutherford in the number two car. There's trouble in turn number two. Bob Matthauser has lost it. The 43 car, Bobby Grimm. Car number 95 has no place to go. All right, again, here's the green flag. And the report, both drivers okay. Point still the leader in car number one. Second, Billy Foster in car 16. Third to the 54 car, Bobby Unser. Fourth place is car number two, Johnny Rutherford. Fifth place is still car number 12, Mario Andretti. Coming out on the outside, it's the popular and famous Novi, driven today by number 59, Jim Herdeby. The Novi, barely seen anywhere but Indianapolis Speedway. There's still a tremendous battle between Foyt in car number one and Foster in the 16 car for the lead. Another race is developing for third place between car number 54, Bobby Unser, and car number two, Johnny Rutherford. The bite of fresh crew chief watches Unser in his car number 54. Power down the front straightaway. Here's the battle for third, Johnny Rutherford in number two. In the low groove, takes over from car number 54, Bobby Unser. Here's the new standing, still leading A.J. Foyt. Car 16, Billy Foster running second. Johnny Rutherford in car number two in third spot. Fourth, Bobby Unser, car number 54. Followed by Mario Andrade in car number 12. Here's the first of the pit stop. Foyt's crew is signaling. We didn't get the message, we'll just have to wait and see. As your leader comes by, A.J. Foyt in car number one. Billy Foster in the 16 car, very close behind, holding down second spot. Back in the field, a lot of jockeying for position. Jim Herdebees in the big red Nova is still running strong. Passes Arnie Knepper into fifth place. Bobby Unser coasting into the pits. It looks like car 54 is out of the race. All right, back to the action. 160 miles an hour down the front straightaway. In turn number one, Arnie Knepper's in trouble. Spinning down into the infield. Crashing into the inside rail on the back straightaway as the field roars past. Rescue crews are rushing to the scene of the accident. There's dust and smoke all over the back straightaway. We're under the yellow flag. Arnie Knepper's out of the car and he's okay. Here is your rundown. A.J. Foyt in car number one, still the leader. Car 16, Billy Foster, second. Third is car number two, Johnny Rutherford. Mario Andrade in fourth place in car number 12. In the fifth spot, car number 59, Jim Herdeby. There's the green and we're underway. A.J. Foyt's father takes a close look as his son roars by, still out in front. Out of turn four, A.J. Foyt gives the sign. He's coming into the pits on the next lap for his first pit stop of the day. He is almost a full lap lead over the second place car, car number 16, Billy Foster. Can he get in and out of the pits without losing that lead? Billy has led from the very beginning. And in just a moment, his crew will be swarming all over the car. Here comes Foster out of the back straightaway into turn four. Pouring it on, trying to get that line before Foyt can get out of the pits. Foyt roars out of the pits, heading for turn number one and still has the lead. Here's your first five positions. Car number one, A.J. Foyt. Second is the 16 car, Billy Foster. Third spot, Johnny Rutherford in car number two. Fourth spot car is number 59, Jim Herdeby. And Mario Andrade holding down fifth spot in car number 12. Johnny Rutherford in car number two is challenging the second place car, Billy Foster, as they head into turn number three. 
out of the third turn, it's Rutherford in the second place, followed by Billy Foster in the 16 car. On the last lap, Billy Foster in the 16 car gave the sign he would be coming into the pits. And here he comes, down on the apron and heading for the pits. Here's the rundown. A.J. Foyt, still the leader in car number one. Second place, Johnny Rutherford in car number two. Billy Foster in car number 16, holding third. Fourth, number 59, Herdebees. And number 12, Andrade. Car number 16, Billy Foster is back out of the pits and pouring it on. Over on the back straightaway, A.J. Foyt moving through traffic, starting to lap cars. Second place, Johnny Rutherford in car number two is in there tight, being passed. Mario Andrade holding down fifth spot in car number 12 is also being lapped by the leader. A tremendous pace by A.J. Foyt all during the day, trying to put more distance between himself and the rest of the pack. Johnny Rutherford in car number two is in there tight. Foyt cuts the low groove on this high bank track, taking the short way around as he come down to the last 50 laps of this race. Tire wear, mechanical failure, metal fatigue, driver exhaustion, anything can happen. The pit crews are pacing up and down. It's a battle of nerves, waiting to see who will take home the money. Which pit crew give the sign for one more pit stop. Into the wall, it's A.J. Foyt, the leader. A roadster cuts into the infield to avoid hitting Foyt's disabled car. The driver fights his way out of the number one car as it catches fire. Foyt rolls on the ground. The fire equipment is there immediately. The ambulance is rolling. The yellow flag is out. Foyt is up and okay. The fire is out. Here comes the new leader, Johnny Rutherford in car number two. Into the pits to take advantage of the yellow flag. Five of the cars coming into the pits. This will be the final pit stop for all cars as we come down to the final laps. Car number 12, Mario Andrade, is trying to go all the way. Here comes Rutherford out of the pits in car number two. Here are the standings. Johnny Rutherford, the new leader in car number two. Mario Andrade, second in car 12. Billy Foster, car number 16, third. Fourth, car number 59, Jim Herdebees. Followed by car number 19, Chuck Rohde. Johnny Rutherford in car number two roars down the straightaway. Watching very closely by his car builder, A.J. Watson. Here's Rutherford with a full lap lead on the entire field. He maintains a blistering pace. The 99 car into the pits and he's out of the race. Right in front of the grandstands, Johnny Rutherford, followed by car number 16, Billy Foster. A full lap behind in third place. There's A.J. Foyt in the pit. Out of turn four, the leader in car number two, Johnny Rutherford, heading into the main straightaway with only three laps to go. The leader is Johnny Rutherford in car number two. Mario Andrade in car 12. Billy Foster in car number 16. Jim Herdebees in car number 59, and Chuck Rohde in car number 19. There's the white flag, one more lap to go. We'll follow the leader all the way around, Johnny Rutherford in car number two, driving very smoothly. Out of turn four and down the main straightaway. There's the checkered flag. Johnny Rutherford in car number two. Driving a beautiful race, taking his cool off lap as the rest of the field comes by for the checkered flag. The combination of Johnny Rutherford, cool professional driver, and A.J. Watson, master car builder, has produced the winner of the Atlanta 250, the only USAC championship car race held in the South during the year. Winner, car number two, Johnny Rutherford.
years ago, the first Indianapolis 500-mile race ushered in a new age of speed. The automobile was still a big joke, and the slogan, Get a Horse, was applied to unlucky motorists who experienced frequent mechanical failures. But inquisitive automotive engineers wanted to find a better way to do things, to make tires that would last, suspension systems and chassis that would function at high speeds with safety, and engines that would run dependably. It took more than 15 years of experimenting to develop the automobile to this point. But from this historical event came the real start of automotive progress. Even in 1911, all the basic elements of the race were present as they are today. The crowds, the excitement, the color, and the noise. The drama of competition and the race driver. The man with his hand on the wheel. him apart from other people. Background doesn't seem to have anything to do with it. Like water finding its own level, the man with driving ability eventually finds his way to the racetrack. He must be quick, confident, and have the ability to make split-second decisions. And most of all, to be able to learn from his mistakes. circuit to the drag strip, this very special breed of cats demonstrate their ability to make all kinds of fast machinery perform. Indianapolis-bound drivers usually begin their training on small-town Michigan sprint car tracks. They learn the hard way, and they have to learn fast. They have to know what to do when mechanical failure overtakes them. Or how to take evasive action when others make a mistake. They must learn to adapt to many conditions, to drive safely on crowded, high-banked, paved tracks, as well as on level ground. To give way when it's sensible, to charge when conditions are just right, and to never drive faster than their ability will allow. Driving on a dirt surface requires a technique all its own. Contact of the wheels with the track can be described as loose and the driver must learn how to slip his way around the course in what is called a controlled skid. Don Branson, driving number four, the wind special, is an expert on this kind of track. This race, the Golden State 100, held at the Sacramento, California State Fairgrounds, is 100 laps, one mile per lap. The exacting demands of driving on the dirt is a constant test of the man with his hand on the wheel. He must fight fatigue and keep adjusting to ever-changing track conditions as the race progresses.
slightest miscalculation in timing is enough to kill all hope of winning. A spin or a pit stop is out of the question. Driver and equipment must be ready to go the total distance without faltering. Phoenix, Arizona, the dirt track at the state fairgrounds was the scene for another 100-mile championship race. Now, a new paved one-mile track, 20 miles from downtown Phoenix, presents a fresh challenge to rising stars like Mario Andretti. taking evasive action. And Bobby Unser is alive because of quick thinking. He ducked as his car went through the railing. Back on the dirt at Springfield, Illinois, the driving techniques are similar to those experienced by championship car drivers. But stock cars create very special problems for the drivers because of their weight. A.J. Foyt, Parnelli Jones, Mario Andretti, and Jim Herdebees are Indianapolis drivers, equally at home behind the wheel of a stalker, on the pavement or on the dirt. Here, a spin more frequently becomes a flip, but roll bar system, shoulder harness, and helmets are all features which help the driver climb out, ready to go racing another day. The 36-degree banking of the Daytona International Raceway requires a very special driving ability and fast reaction when trouble develops at 170 miles per hour. The inaugural 500-mile race held on this track in 1959 was run without the caution flag being displayed even once. The Indianapolis 500 has always been classed as an international event, but from 1916 until 1965, the European competition was almost non-existent. Now, Graham Hill of London, England, takes his first look at the famous oval. Scotsman Jimmy Clark won the 500 last year, and another Scotsman, Jackie Stewart, joins the growing competition from across the water. American drivers approach the situation as though they are about to climb a tall mountain. Current Europeans are almost casual in early month of May practice. But whatever the attitude or approach, a lot of men have spent 55 years trying to unlock the secrets of this most famous of all race courses. Chuck Hulse is a successful veteran midget and sprint car driver. But the key to success has eluded him here at Indianapolis. Suddenly, it's as though he had unlocked a magic door. His practice speeds climb higher and higher to near record performance. But Art Malone is not so lucky. A drag strip champion still trying to solve the riddle of Indianapolis. Mario Andretti took his first look at Indianapolis in 1965 and liked it. In fact, he liked the whole USAC circuit. The Italian-born rookie took third at Indianapolis, went on to win the national championship. Now, on May 14th, the first day of qualifying, he eyes the pole position for this 50th 500. His speed climbs to a new one-lap high of 166.328. The four-lap average is 165.899. 
an all-time record at Indianapolis for qualification. Now the drivers know what they have to shoot for. Some are content just to make the field. But A.J. Foyt never settles for second best if he can help it. Just an inch too close to the wall, and the jolting crash is the result. Foyt still has a long way to go to make this race. Graham Hill is in. So is former winner Parnelli Jones. And Jim McElroy. And Foyt is boring. One of the essential elements of a race car is the cooling system and its pressure cap. Regular stand pressure caps have been used on all the finishers of the Indianapolis 500 since 1960 without a single failure. The pressure cap must withstand tremendous track vibrations, high temperatures, high water pump pressures, and high water velocity without losing coolant or pressure. Race cars require pressure caps for the same reason as passenger cars, to permit higher engine operating temperatures for better efficiency without boiling, and to increase pump efficiency. Stan's track representative, Jimmy Jackson, an experienced 500 driver, knows the importance of leak-proof cooling systems and a pressure cap that will hold and relieve pressure at the proper points. He works directly with the mechanics, making sure that the filler neck is in perfect condition and that a cap of the proper pressure range is used. The entire cooling system of each racer is tested by means of a regular stamped pressure tester. A stamped pressure cap is a small part of the total car, but it is very important and one of the factors which can help bring driver and car into winner's circle. Half a century ago, they held the balloon race as sort of a side attraction to the 500. This being the 50th anniversary, it was decided to try and recreate some of the nostalgic past. A beautiful thought, a lovely sentiment, but balloons are still as unpredictable as they were 55 years ago. Scratch one outhouse. Grand Superintendent Clarence Cagle now has one more big headache. Meanwhile, back on the track, Bob Bite is having trouble with his Batmobile. A fuel line ruptures. The back of his car becomes a flaming torch. He guides the car around the infield, standing up, while fire trucks catch up and put out the fire before he comes to a stop. Other drivers have their troubles trying to find the groove. It looks so easy for Andretti. What's wrong? continues. Ronnie Duman makes it. So does Larry Dixon, Bobby Grimm, Al Miller, Eddie Johnson, and Bobby Unser. 33 spots are filled. And then, race day.
Well, the big moment that we've been waiting for has arrived. And to do honor to this moment with those famous words, here is Mr. Tony Alman. In 1961, 32 roadsters and one rear engine car started the 500. Today, 32 rear engine cars and one roadster will start. Outstanding progress in five short years. But what is the limit? This race may provide some of the answers. watches as the race comes to a halt for the third time in history. Once many years ago for rain, but twice in three years for an accident. Who goofed? The hand on the wheel, to be sure. But whose hand? No one will ever be absolutely sure. It all happened too fast. But the stern reality is that 11 out of 33 cars are out of the race before even one lap is run. Half a million dollars worth of racing machinery ruined, but not a single scratch on any of the drivers. Were you stunned, or did anything happen to you personally? Well, uh, you get knocked about a bit in a race car, but uh, you're not supposed to be a 98-pound weakling. I mean, after all, uh, uh, Dr. Hanna gives us a real good physical, and we're supposed to be able to survive a few hard knocks. Uh, it knocked me around. Uh, uh, a 1,400-pound automobile was pretty heavy when it's sitting on top of your head, but he wasn't up there long. <laughs> Now the race gets underway again, slowly, under the caution flag. Mechanics in the pits try to repair battered cars and catch up with the field. And then the green flag drops. Mario Andretti accelerates ahead, closely pursued by Jim Clark. It's Johnny Boyd in turn one. His car is against the wall. Now 12 cars are out, and there's still 194 laps to go. Andretti continues his lead, but when he accelerates, nothing happens. Chuck Hulse in his win special is running with the leaders. time around, Clark is in front. Andretti is three seconds back, and then everybody begins to get the message. Andretti's got big trouble. His engine is sick. In the back stretch, George Steiner spins around and hits Chuck Hulse. Hulse brings his wind special to a stop safely but the car body is too damaged to continue. The field is now reduced by two more cars for a total of 14. Then it's 15. Andretti gives up and pulls into the pits. His sick engine is through. Clark comes down the front straightaway. He's a lap ahead, and Andretti climbs out. There is just no way for him to run this race. A 
comedy of errors with last year's winner as the star. But the style of the champion shows up in the way Jim Clark recovers, keeps the car off the wall, then continues on into the pits for normal service and damage inspection. Lloyd Ruby moves through the turns and through the straightaway before Clark can get back on the track. Another car out, this time with steering problems. And another driver, Roger Moore, decides that this is a real good time to retire. Lloyd Ruby sacrifices his lead over Jim Clark to come in for service. Clark is back in front, but he can't seem to stay there. Ruby slips by him again. So does Graham Hill. Parnelli Jones joins the list of spectator drivers. He's got a bad wheel bearing. Ruby moves out and away from Clark. And as the middle of the race comes up, Clark continues to drop back. Jackie Stewart passes in the main straightaway. This puts Ruby first, Stewart second, Clark third, and Graham Hill lurking somewhere nearby. Then, Ruby is slowing down. He's losing oil. The black flag is dropped, and he comes in after a gallant try for a place in victory lane. Scotsman Jackie Stewart inherits first place. Clark is second. It's Al Unser at the head of the main straightaway. One more car is out, but Unser is safe. Stewart leads. Graham Hill has passed Clark for second. And now it begins to look as if this is a race that no one wants to win. Stewart, a rookie driver, leading in the 192nd lap of the race, slows down. His oil pressure is gone, and the engine quits. Gallantly, he pushes the car toward the pits, as Graham Hill takes the lead with Jimmy Clark close behind. Sweeps through the final lap and earns the checkered flag. Clark is a sure second and Jim McElreath is third. Graham Hill of London, England, a world road racing champion but an Indianapolis rookie, pulls into victory lane. The first such victory since 1927. How did he win? Well, circumstances played a part to be sure. But being in the right place at the right time is a part of the strategy a champion uses to win a race. That and having a sure, steady hand on the wheel. every available grandstand seat around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, an overflow crowd restlessly awaits the dawning of the first 200 mile per hour lap. This year, 1971 Paul Center, Peter Rutsch of the Redondo Beach, and the green flag is on 
If Indy's 200-mile-per-hour barrier is to be smashed, it will take someone with the sensitive skills and expertise of Gulf McLaren driver Peter Revson. In the 1972 500-mile race, he finished second. As a rookie in 1969, Revson lined up 33rd, then pushed through the pack to place fifth. Revson knows Indianapolis. So does Johnny Rutherford, his Gulf McLaren teammate. His 10-mile average speed of over 192 miles per hour puts Repson dramatically into the 1973 500. He'll start 10th. But this year's really blood-boiling speeds are yet to come, as Revson knows. Briefly, a gloomy shower blunts further qualification attempts. But suddenly, the speeds rise. 14 drivers grapple to attain 200 and fail. Finally, Johnny Rutherford gets saddled up. At 200 miles per hour on the two and a half mile speedway, a racing car travels the length of a football field a second. Concentration becomes complete. And the difference between success and failure is measured by a driver's heartbeat. Rutherford needs a lap time of 45 seconds on the button. His opening lap speed of 198 and a half misses it. Then his second drops off to 197. people hanging over the rail and waving their arms and coats and flags and everything they had. And I thought, this, uh, either I'm going very smoothly and I'm actually setting up on the pole position at this point in time, or something is falling off of the car. Rutherford's stupendous four-lap average of over 198 miles per hour is only a heartbeat away from 200. But it brings him the pole position and makes him the fastest qualifier in the history of the Speedway. And the crowd, suddenly exhausted and sobered by the speed onslaught, takes stock. Bobby Unzer and Mark Donahue, both former winners, will balance the record-busting Rutherford along the 500's front row. But the 500-mile sweepstakes are by tradition cruel on pole position drivers like Rutherford. In 57 races, only nine men who've started on the pole have gone on to finish up inside victory lane. In Gasoline Alley, impeccable mechanics work round the clock. But unlike the high-strung drivers, they stay relaxed and loose. Dennis Davis, chief mechanic for Rutherford. Basically, I don't have too much to do with the policy of how the car runs or anything like that. Make sure the guys do the things the way I'd like them done. If it falls on its face, well, it's down to me, and if it goes good, they say it's also down to me. Morning. Two days before the 500, the wings are set, and powerful engines given a final tweak. Time to check it all out. 
Mechanics roll their splendid 200 mile per hour charges out for a last run. And once again, the tension becomes palpable. Drivers Rutherford and then Revson go to work. To really memorize the behavior of his car, a driver must ring it out brutally during these final carburation tests. And now, with the 500 barely two days off, Peter Repson shoves his foot into it. sweep out toward the, the wall and get set for turn four, where again, I come just a little bit off full throttle um, to steady the car and then back in it again hard. I'm coming down the front straight and I have a chance to glance at my board. I'm satisfied and uh, I feel this will be quite competitive for the race. sophistication. But to coax optimum performance and speed from the design, vigorous checking and rechecking is vital. Most important, a driver must be able to communicate with his mechanics, to exhort and encourage them just as they do him. Gulf's racing cars have been called laboratories on wheels because the development and improvement of petroleum products has always been an important objective of Gulf's motorsport program. 1973 is Johnny Rutherford's first on the Gulf McLaren team. He brings with him determination, dedication, and rock-rigid confidence in himself, gleaned from a decade on the hard-boiled dirt tracks. 1973 is Rutherford's 10th 500 and 15th anniversary as a race driver. Like Rutherford, Peter Revson possesses a wide repertory of skills. An internationally graded road racer, he's a past champion of the tough Canadian-American Challenge Cup series. But in a racing career that already has been stunning, victory at Indianapolis has so far been elusive. sixth time in ten years and fourth year in a row, auto racing's million dollar marathon is ruptured by violence. Eleven cars lay crippled and guillotined along the home stretch. 
and anxious drivers pitch in to achieve desperate repairs before the rains come. Two days, one aborted start, and several rain squalls later, the pack regroups. Flying start, Bobby Unzer plunges to the lead. Off turn three, Unzer's opening lap burst is a record setting 177 miles per hour. Attrition comes early for Bobby Allison, whose engine flames. Meanwhile, Rutherford, making a disciplined bid, bides his time in fourth. But teammate Peter Revson is missing. Barely three laps into the race, a grinding brush along the wall demolishes half of Gulf McLaren's hopes. As Hunter and Mark Donahue hog the lead, a dozen drivers swap position behind them. Wedged tightly together in the corner, Bill Vukovich and Gordon Johncock clang wheels at nearly 180 miles per hour. At 60 miles, Unzer stops. And here comes Rutherford. Well-coordinated mechanics pounce under and over the car, accomplishing the impossible in seconds. The black flag. To sop up the nagging fuel leak, six laps go down the drain. Rutherford falls to the cellar. For others, the heartbeat 500 quickens. 1972 United States Auto Club champion Joe Leonard achieves a phenomenal recovery. But a few heartbeats later, at the head of the fourth turn, Swede Savage's fuel-swollen car cannot recover. Bewildered mechanics see still another fire flare in Al Unzer's car as the crisis marred 500 is aborted for the third time in three days. But an hour and 15 minutes later, with 300 miles to go and another storm front moving in, the war resumes with Unzer taking temporary command. Jimmy Carruthers' hopes disintegrate at the same moment. Rutherford, regaining his rhythm, catapults himself back inside the top 10. Al Unzer's blown engine at 300 miles finishes him, and the lead is passed back to Gordon Shonka. Rutherford scrambles to ninth as Bobby Unzer falls out. But a lashing rain is something even leader Gordon Johncock cannot outrun. And finally, after 332 and a half miles, the red flag is waved in the rain and the race ends. But what is winner Gordon Johncock thinking now?
about the rain, about the glory, or is he, like the other rain-soaked survivors of the 57th Indianapolis, distinctly relieved that the 200-mile-per-hour heartbeats have eased? <laughs>